Let's take a look at a diagrammatic representation of the conduction system in the heart that's relevant to interpreting the 12 lead ECG. But before we do that, I need to introduce two terms to you, depolarization and repolarization. Now these two terms belie some quite complex physiological processes and I advise you to look at any good anatomy and physiology book to understand them. But basically you need to understand that the heart has the intrinsic ability to create an electrical impulse within it, devoid of a nervous impulse. As long as it's got a blood supply, the heart can generate an electrical impulse. It has what we know uh, to be an autorhythmic quality. Of course there are nervous impulses going to the heart. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems increase or decrease heart rate and contractility but the heart has an autorhythmic quality. It can generate its own electrical impulse. So depolarization is the creation of an electrical impulse and repolarization is electrical resetting in its simplest form. In health, depolarization starts in the top right of the heart. That's the patient's right. You can see that on the diagram there in the sinoatrial or SA node. And that's the pacemaker of the heart because it depolarizes the most frequently. See the arrows spreading out from the SA node? That's because the electrical impulse spreads through both atria preceding their contraction. The electrical impulse then squeezes through the atrioventricular or AV node and in health this is the only connection electrically between atria and ventricles. Depolarization then travels down the left and right bundle branches and through the smaller Purkinje fibres and this precedes ventricular contraction. OK, let's relate that now to one ECG complex. What you're seeing on the screen now is one heartbeat represented on paper, electrically. It's one ECG complex. Let's go through it. The flat line at either end of the complex is the isoelectric line, where electrically nothing is happening. Then you see, moving from the left, the P wave. This represents both atria being depolarized together. Two atria give one P wave. Then you have a flat line. This is where the electrical impulse is squeezing through that narrow band of tissue in the middle of the heart, the atrioventricular or AV node, so it takes a little bit of time. We know that as the PR interval. In reality, we measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the end of that flat line. And this will become more relevant as we review our 12 lead ECGs. Then you see the big QRS complex. Just run it together, QRS complex. And that represents depolarization of the larger ventricles. Then there is a pause, the ST segment, and then there is electrical resetting or repolarization of the ventricles, represented by the T wave. Of course, there is repolarization of the atria, but that occurs underneath the QRS complex. And that is one heartbeat represented electrically. So this complex represents sinus rhythm, which we hope to see in our patients. But the question is, if the patient is in sinus rhythm, how do the leads differ on the 12 lead ECG? Well, it's about the relationship between the general direction of depolarization through the heart and from where the 12 different leads view this. Do remember that when we refer to leads, this can mean two things. The electrodes we attach to the patient, but also the points from which the ECG is looking at the heart. And that's what we're referring to here. We're talking about interpretation, not recording a 12 lead ECG. This general direction of depolarization is known as the cardiac axis, and it spreads from the patient's top right, the sinus node, through the atrioventricular or AV node, and down to the left ventricle, as this has a larger muscle mass than the right ventricle, and extra wiring for want of a better phrase. Of course depolarization spreads all around the heart, but the general direction follows that pathway. In addition, as depolarization heads towards the lead, it causes an upward deflection from baseline, which we can see on the 12 lead, and as it heads away from a lead, it causes a downward deflection, 
We see this best in the QRS complex, which will be positive with a tall R wave and a shorter S wave as depolarization heads towards that lead, and a short R wave and a deeper S wave as depolarization heads away from that lead, positive and negative. Now to see how this manifests on the 12 lead ECG, we can look at the limb leads and then we can look at the chest leads. Here's the normal 12 lead ECG or EKG again, and you'll see to the left you have a variety of leads. These are the limb leads 1, 2, 3 and VR, VL and VF, commonly with the letter A before them. To the right are the chest leads, progressing from V1 to V6, sometimes C1 to C6, obviously standing for chest. You know when you place the limb leads on the patient that you place four of them, on the wrists or the arms and the legs. But in reality the 12 lead ECG gives you six limb leads. What you're looking at here is what we call an adapted form of the hexaxial reference system. And by explaining this to you, you'll realise why the leads differ slightly even though they're all in sinus rhythm. What you're looking at is just the limb leads here, not the chest leads. You can see in the middle is a line drawing of the heart, and around it are all of the limb leads. Those lines that come from those limb leads represent which areas of the heart that they look at. So for example, AVR looks over the right atrium and VL or AVL over the left atrium. The different shapes we see in the limb leads are due to this relationship between the cardiac axis and where the leads look at the general pathway of depolarization. AVR is very negative, look at the small R wave and deep S wave, and the P and T waves are upside down or inverted as the cardiac axis is heading away from that lead, from 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock if you imagine the heart is like a clock face. Lead 2 is very upright as depolarization is heading towards it, while AVL, or VL here, has an R wave as tall as the S wave is deep, as depolarization passes at right angles, neither towards it nor away from it. Leads 1, AVF and 2 are still quite upright as they sense depolarization heading towards them. Now sometimes lead 2 isn't the tallest, it may be a lead nearby. It is normal for the cardiac axis to swing a little to the right or left between people. But significant left or right axis deviation is something we're not looking at in this workshop, but you may like to look that up for yourself. Now understanding this diagram is very important, because I'm going to show you here the normal 12 lead ECG. And you can't really work out where those limb leads are looking unless you have that picture, here it is again, in your mind. So it's very helpful when you're out in clinical practice to be able to draw this quite quickly, perhaps on the back of the ECG, if your memory has failed you or you're still learning which area of the heart the limb leads look at. So why don't we just draw that very quickly? I'm drawing a Y shape, simple as that, labelling it AVR, AVL and AVF. You can simply do this on the back of your 12 lead. Add in your three remaining limb leads, one, two, and three, and then draw an outline of a heart shape, like that, and that immediately tells you which areas of the heart those leads are looking at. You can see that leads three, AVF, and two look at the inferior or low down part of the heart, lead one, the lateral left ventricle, AVR and AVL, the right and left atrium respectively. Then draw in an arrow. That's your cardiac axis, 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And then you can work out how positive or upright, or negative or downwards, the QRS complex is in the various leads because of their relationship to that arrow as it comes towards the lead or away from it. Progressing on, let's look at the chest leads, and these are slightly easier to understand. Uh, if you look at this diagram, this is where the leads are placed, and although I said I wouldn't look at uh, where we stick leads, uh, this helps you to understand that the chest leads look at the heart from a horizontal plane. Here we are with the 12 lead ECG, and you're looking at the right hand side, V1 through to V6, sometimes known as C1 to C6 for chest.
You'll notice that the QRS complex progresses from being very negative in V1 with a short upright R wave and a deep S wave to being very positive in V5, V6 with a tall R wave and hardly any or none at all S wave. Now normally V5 is the tallest, although here V4 seems to be competing for that, but normally and that doesn't matter, that's fine, but normally you see V5 as the tallest. So if we go back to this diagram, I'll explain why. Again, it's the general direction of depolarization through the heart, that is the cardiac access, and V1 senses most of that depolarization heading away from it and gives you a very downward or negative QRS complex and V5 and V6 sense most of the depolarization heading towards them and gives you a very upright R wave and hardly any S wave, sometimes none at all. So the chest leads progress from negative to positive, from V1 or C1 to V6 or C6. If you want to know the heart rate, <laughs> well, take the patient's pulse, of course, and usually the heart rate is also printed on your 12 lead. But if you don't have this information, you can work it out from the complexes. You need to count the number of large squares between the same two points on two adjacent complexes. And normally we count the number of large squares between two R waves, the R to R interval. If the heart rate is very high, you won't get many large squares between the R waves. So if there is one large square between an R wave and the next R wave, we divide that into 300. 300 divided by 1 is 300, so the heart rate is very high at 300. If there are two large squares, the heart rate is 150. Three large squares, 100. Four large squares, 75. Five large squares, 60, and so on. Divide the number of large squares into 300. Don't worry if it isn't in whole numbers. For example, if you have one and a half large squares or 2.2 large squares, whatever, just divide that figure into 300. So it might be 3.2 or 4.8. Whatever it is, divide it into 300. Now, this is fine when the heart rate is regular. But when it's irregular, and this normally corresponds to atrial fibrillation, the heart rate accelerates and slows down over the period of a minute. So counting the number of large squares really doesn't give a good representation of what the heart rate is. So there are various ways of calculating the heart rate in atrial fibrillation or other irregular arrhythmias. And what we tend to do, or what I do, is I count out 30 large squares. This equals 6 seconds. I count the number of R waves in that 30 large square period and I times by 10. It's not brilliant, but it picks up much more of the pattern of irregularity. I have to be honest, I would strongly recommend you take the pulse of the patient for a full minute. If anything, when you take a pulse, you get more information from the patient, such as the strength and character of the pulse. So if you need to find out whether the heart rate is regular, just place a piece of paper over the 12 lead ECG and mark off two R waves. When you move the piece of paper along and lay the first mark over an R wave, the second mark should correspond to the next R wave. It's regular. If it doesn't, there is a suspicion that it could be atrial fibrillation. Be aware it could be other things such as sinus arrhythmia, which is where the heart rate, usually in younger patients, slightly accelerates and decelerates with breathing in and out. I'm Dr. Richard Hatchett for fastlearnecg.com.